Hi guys, in this video, I'm finally gonna talk about automatic differentiations. So in the example so far, what we've done, we've calculated the derivatives, the gradient by hand, and we coded them by hand. And while this is okay for very simple examples, like the toy neural networks that we've played with, it becomes very tedious and intractable for larger scale neural networks. Luckily, there are also automatic approaches. So, so in order to compare the different approaches, I want to talk about um, the magnitude of operations that is used in each approach. So first, let's see what is the magnitude of operation of a forward pass. So let's suppose that the total number of weights in the neural network that we have is denoted by W. Now, W are not the vector of weights or a matrix of weight. It's the actual number of weights that we have. Um, so a forward pass will be in the order of big O of W. And what it means is that it will be some constant times this W, or it can be bounded by this constant times this W. And it also means that the dominant term in doing the operations uh, in one forward pass is the number of weights. And this is because the bulk of the computation is in the matrix multiplication and not so much in the activation function. So suppose we have this linear layer, which takes the activation from the previous layer, multiplies it by some weights matrix, adds a bias, and we can join everything together. We can add vector, we can add a, one element into the vector of activations, and we can append the B vector into the W, and we will get that it's just one big vector times the matrix multiplication. And now suppose uh, AL was four dimensions and we added one, so it's a five dimension vector. And suppose W now is a five by 10 matrix. So we will have a one by five vector multiplied by a five by 10 matrix, and we will get 50 operations. And the activations of the previous layer was just four. If we look at the, the current layer, it's 10, but still four or 10, they are still negligent compared to 50. So we see that most of the operations come from the matrix multiplication, and the matrix multiplication is mainly affected by the number of weights, by the how big W is. And so this is why it's in order of W. Now let's look what happens in manual differentiation, what we did so far. So the pro of manual differentiation is that using backprop, uh, we stay at the magnitude of W to get the derivative. If we wouldn't use backprop, if we would calculate the derivative of the loss with regards to each and single weight, so we would have for each single weight to go over the entire computation graph in a forward pass and then go backward to calculate its derivative, it's still an order of W, but now we have to multiply this by all the different weights. It will be order of W times order of W, which is order of W squared. But with backprop, we do it only once. We go once forward, once backward, and so it's order of W plus order of W. And so this is just stays order of W. So the pro is that it's fast. The con is that we have to compute it manually. We have to sit down and calculate uh, what are the gradients and we have to code it and it can be a hassle. And in addition, uh, we can have errors. We can calculate it wrong. We can implement it wrong. It's very prone to errors. Another approach is using numerical differentiations. So for each weight, we can calculate the loss of that weight plus some epsilons, subtract from this the loss with the regular weight, how it is now, and divide by this epsilon, and we'll get some approximation of the derivative, uh, plus a truncation error, which is the order of epsilon. So the pro of this is that we don't need to calculate derivative at all. It's all numerical. We just It's very easy to implement. You just do it and you get a derivative. But big con of it is that we lost the big O of W magnitude of operations that we had before. We are now again in big O of W squared because now we have to do this pair weight. So we have to add a small weight just for the first weight in our big list, yeah? So it can be all the W1, the B1, the W2, the B2. Let's make a big vector, a big list of all of them. Change just the first element in W1, calculate the loss function, divided by epsilon, get the approximate derivative, go back, leave w, leave the first element as it was before, change only the second element, 
et cetera, et cetera. So this is magnitude of W squared. Another problem is that it's not very accurate. We have this truncation error, which we can lower in a few ways. So one way is to use the central differences. This is, this is basically one side difference, but we can look at central differences and take both plus epsilon and minus epsilon and divide it by two epsilons. And if this looks intimidating, this is all basic calculus and comes from the definition of the derivatives. Yeah, when, this, when epsilon goes to zero, this is the derivative. And then the, the truncation error is of magnitude epsilon squared, but this will double the amount of computations. Doubling the amount still means we are in O of W squared, but it's still double the amount of computation. And you might ask, wait, didn't we have to calculate this also for each derivative? Well, no. Uh, this term we only had to calculate once because it's the loss with regards to the weights the way they are now. And so we only calculate once and we get a number. And then we only make a slight difference in each and every weight and we calculate the difference between them. And so we only had to do it once, but, but now we have to do it twice. Once by adding an epsilon and once by subtracting an epsilon. So much more computation. Okay, another thing we can do is just take epsilon to be smaller and smaller. If we take epsilon to be smaller and smaller, this truncation error goes down. But we can't really do this, at least not infinitely small. And this is because our machines, our computers, they have a finite precision uh, that they can work with. So if we lower epsilon more and more, eventually we will have rounding errors. Maybe we didn't reach the point of our finite precision, yeah? But still, all the calculations causes us to lose precision. And of course, we can't lower it below our machine epsilon. So if our machine has an epsilon of 2 to the power of minus 64, if we take epsilon to be lower than that, it just our machine can't handle it. But even before that, if we use something that is above it, we will still get rounding errors from the operations that will be done on this epsilon. And still, numerical differentiation is a useful tool to check if the implementation of the differentiation, which can also be the backprop algorithm, was correct or not. Okay, so these are the two methods we discussed so far, the manual differentiation that we actually did and implemented, numerical differentiation, we use it only as a checkup tool to see if our implementation was right. The third option, which is what all the programs, all the frameworks actually use, is automatic differentiation. And what automatic differentiation does, it leverages the fact that every function, no matter how complicated, is made of elementary arithmetic operation. So for example, addition, subtraction, multiplication, division, as well as elementary functions. So exponent, log, sinus, cosinus, etc. So what we can do is we can map every operation to its respective derivative. So suppose we have a function of x plus a function of x, the derivative will be the derivative plus the derivative. And if we subtract, it's minus. And if we multiple, it's the product rule. And if we divide, it's the quotient rule. And if we take the power, it's a different rule. If we multiply by a constant, it's just a constant. If it's a polynomial, it's this thing. Sinus is cosine, cosine is minus sine. Exponent stays the same. Log becomes one of over x, et cetera, et cetera. So our neural network can be represented as a graph of operations. So let's take a simple case. Suppose uh, we have here two weights, w1, w2, and some bias term. And suppose our activation is the exponent. Yeah, so the exponent. And our loss is we take y and we take the squared difference loss. OK, so this representation is how we wrote down the network before. But notice it doesn't show us the function with regards to uh, what we actually care about with regards to the weights. Yeah, so x1, x2, and y and 1 are all known. What are not known is w1, w2, and b. For now, let's suppose b is known. So we can change the graph to represent our weights. And also for simplicity, we can even break it down further to the most basic operations. Yeah, so we have x1 times w1. So let's just break it into a variable w1, which is our variable of interest, times some constant, yeah, because x1 will be some data point, which we'll, we'll know its value, and an operation which is multiplication. And then we have a, a addition. And then we have another addition. Then we have the exponent. Then we have a subtraction. Then we have, then we have the power of 2 or the square. Okay, So 
we can take this and now we can focus on each node. So if we take the multiplication node, we can represent both the value of the function, so w1 times x1, and its derivative. So because the derivative here is with regards to the variable w1, and this is a constant, we just get the constant. And note that because w1 is kind of like, I don't know, a terminal node, a beginner node, um, we only take the derivative up to that. Uh, otherwise, if it was some intermediate quantity, we would have to take, using the chain rule, also the derivative with regard to that. Yeah? So we will get x1 times the derivative of that node. And notice also that we only took the derivative with regards to w1. We could have also taken the derivative with regard to w2, because here we have a function that has two variables, w1 and w2. Uh, but this would be 0 in our case. It doesn't matter so much. These are implementation details. I want to give you the main concepts here. It's basically a computation graph where each operation uh, is mapped both to the function value and to the derivative using the rules that we defined here. So this was for this node. If we look at the plus node, then, well, the value will just be the sum. The derivative will just be the sum of the derivative. Here, if we look only at w1 or only w2, one of these will be 0. The exponent will be this rule over here. If we look now here, then this will be the case. And notice I wrote f1 and f2 because here I will treat this as f1, this is f2, f3. These are intermediate quantities. And finally, f7. Okay. And we did this here on individual elements, but we could also use mat matrix operations to do this. Yeah, so if we call this f1 now, this f2, and finally this f3, then we could calculate this. And this is a vector times a vector. The derivative will be a vector, will be this thing. And we continue on to get these quantities over here. And we can even take more complicated example, like the example we've been using so far, where we have this w1, which is a 2 by 3 matrix. Again, in order not to deal with tensors, let's flatten it to be a 6D vector. And now, we can both calculate the value and the derivative. So the derivative here, we will have basically z11 all before going to the activation. And sorry, here I call them f11, f12, and f13 because I took them to be this intermediate quantity. And so I will get this matrix of derivative of Jacobian. So we can implement it also in matrix notation, not just in, not just in single variable notation. OK, so I want to talk about dual numbers. And what dual numbers are is a very elegant way to implement basically what we discussed before. So in, do, in forward mode, you calculate both the function value and the derivative as you go forward in the network. And wouldn't it be nice if instead of doing one operation to calculate the, the function value and another operation to calculate the derivative, you could do just one operation and it would act on both uh, elements and calculate both the function value and its derivative. So this is exactly what the dual numbers are. They, the implementation of dual numbers is basically a data structure. Uh, the data structure stores both the function value and its derivative. So it will have both a value and a derivative, like I wrote here. But it's also overloading the operation. So for example, if you do a plus on uh, two dual numbers, it will, it will add both the function values and it will add the function derivatives. If you do a multiplication, it will do a multiplication of the values and the product rule for the derivative. So this is very, very useful in forward mode because, again, in forward mode, you go forward in the network, you go forward in the computational graph. In reverse mode, as much as I could understand, uh, I don't see it implemented. All the sources I could look uh, up don't mention uh, using dual numbers. It also kind of doesn't make sense because the operations are different now. You do the operations for the values in the forward pass, and then you calculate the derivatives in the backward pass. So it doesn't make sense to create this data structure and overload the operations. One final thing is that this data structure that we call dual is actually, it actually has a basis in mathematics. So dual numbers are something in mathematics. It's a device that was created in mathematics in the late 19th century. 
but it's basically the same. So I, I think my explanation of it as a data structure is quite accurate uh, and it's quite equivalent to the mathematical expression. So you would write a dual number like this, where the epsilon represents the, the derivative, basically. And the epsilon is kind of like the imaginary unit in complex numbers. The only thing is that instead of in the complex number, when you take the i to the power of 2, you get minus 1. Here, when you take epsilon to the power of 2, you get 0. And there's a lot of math that you can show about this and Taylor series and etc. But notice it's just like in complex number. If you add two duals together, you get the sum of their values and the sums of their derivative. If you multiply it, you get uh, the multiplication of their values. And you will get that the epsilon terms have this. And there's another term, b d epsilon squared. But epsilon squared, we define it to be equal to 0, so it disappears. And what do you know? a d b c is exactly the product rule. Yeah, It's the value of the function of one function times the derivative of another plus the derivative of the other times the value of the function. Yeah, So this is just a way to write it all in symbols and in mathematical notation. It actually came before uh, these data structures that implemented as this dual number. Personally, I'm not sure how much it helps. For me, it's a bit, all this math, you know, I expect it to be useful, but if I already understand the concept in its implementation mode, uh, the math doesn't really help me. But if it helps you, maybe go and learn a bit more about uh, dual numbers. And finally, uh, the biggest thing I want to mention here is that all of these implementations, they don't save, they don't save expression. They save the actual numeric value. Yeah, so what you would get after doing uh, a lot of calculation, you won't get this. You will get an actual number or an actual vector of numbers. Okay, and this is important because another point to talk about is the difference between automatic differentiation and symbolic differentiation. So almost every source I could find online about automatic differentiation states that automatic differentiation is not symbolic differentiation, but at least as much as I could understand, um, symbolic differentiation does pretty much the same as automatic differentiation. The only difference is that it saves the actual symbols, the, the actual formula. So if you calculate the derivative like we did before, you the formula is this thing over here, okay? And symbolic differentiation will save this formula, it will actually save this formula. Automatic differentiation will just save a number, or in this case, a vector of two numbers. So it will save these, and then it will save the, the vector after it multiplied by this, and then it will save the vector after multiplied by this. But you just save the numbers. You don't save the entire syntactical tree of expressions. And so this is the only difference that I could find between these two modes of differentiation. If I'm wrong, and if you can prove me wrong, uh, and convince me that I'm wrong, then please leave a comment below, both about the dual numbers and the automatic differentiation. Um, some people claim that dual numbers are also used in reverse mode. I couldn't find any source that backs this up, and it also doesn't make any sense. But if you can prove this to me and convince me, leave a comment, and I will thank you. Finally, the frameworks and libraries that are used in order to implement neural networks, they their main strength is the, the fact that they have autodiff. So Torch and PyTorch, TensorFlow, Theano, they all have autodiff, and that allows you to create your network structure, define everything, and don't think about derivatives. The derivatives, they calculated all for you. It relieves you of the burden to calculate the derivatives by hand, as we mentioned before. So that's all for this video. I hope you enjoyed, and see you in the next one.